Well, now it's circular motion and gravitation. You know, before we go into circular motion, uh, we need to know that circular motion is not exactly rotational motion. They are connected, but they are not exactly the same. So if you look at a ceiling fan, it has an axis of rotation, right? An axis of rotation. Now, that's rotational motion. On the other hand, if you have a, a string with a stone tied to one end and you hold the other end in your hand and just whirl it around, it, your hand is the point where the axis is passing through and the stone is the object. So now you can see that the axis of rotation is outside of the object, which is the stone. So that's rotational motion. So in circular motion, I mean, that is circular motion. So in circular motion, the axis of rotation is outside the object, while in rotational motion, the axis of rotation passes through the object. So now we need to define what angle is. It may look very obvious, but you know, we're used to talking about angle in degrees, like 90 degrees, 180 degrees, but the unit of angle is not degrees, it's radians. The unit of angle is radians. And radians is defined as the length of the arc divided by the radius. So if delta theta is the angle, you see the arc here, AB, the length of the arc divided by the radius gives you that angle in radians. So that's the definition of angle. So angle is length of the arc divided by the radius. That's when you get it in radians. So in this case, delta theta is delta S by R. So that's how angle is defined. And then we need to know how to convert from degrees into radian. So here is a chart where it shows that 30 degrees is pi by 6 radians, 60 degrees is pi by 3, 90 degrees is pi by 2, and so on. So how do you convert from degrees into radians? So we know 2 pi radians is 360 degrees, or pi radians is 180 degrees. Therefore, to get it in radians, all you got to do is multiply the degrees by pi divided by 180. So multiply the degree by pi divided by 180. Here's an example. So if you have 30 degrees, 30 times pi by 180. And you know, 30 and 180, the factor is 6. So that's how we get 30 degrees as pi by 6 radians. And so you can do that conversion similarly. And if ever you have to change from radians into degrees, do the opposite. Multiply by 180, divide by pi. Multiply by 180, divide by pi. And next, uh, we define a quantity called angular velocity, represented by omega. Angular velocity is angle divided by time. So it's measured in radians per second because angle is in radians, time is in seconds. But again, angular velocity is also related to frequency. Frequency is the number of rotations in one second. Okay, number of rotations in one second. And uh, here is an example where uh, the frequency is given in rotations per minute, RPM. So suppose we have five rotations per minute. First, we need to change it into rotations per second. Okay, so five rotations per minute is five divided by 60 rotations per second, because there are 60 seconds in a minute. And once you get that, that's the frequency, because you got it in rotations per second. And then you calculate omega simply using the formula 2 pi f. 
2 pi times where f is the frequency 5 by 60. When you do that calculation, you get 0 0.524 radians per second. So that's how you change frequency into angular velocity. There is also a formula to relate linear velocity with angular velocity. Now it makes total sense if you look at this diagram. The wheels of a car are rotating or that is circular motion. But at the same time, the car has a linear velocity. Like uh, we say it's moving at 45 miles per hour. That's the linear velocity. So we need to connect the linear velocity with the angular velocity. And the formula is V is equal to R times omega. V is the linear velocity, omega is the angular velocity. As an example, uh, you know, let's, let's assume that the radius of the wheels is half a meter. That's a really big tire, a wheel, but I'm just assuming it. And then that the velocity is 10 meter per second. Uh, so we can now find the angular velocity using this formula. And you get omega is V by R, which is 10 divided by 0.5. So that becomes 20 radians per second. So in this problem, you were given the linear velocity and you were trying to find, or we were trying to find the angular velocity, all right? And, uh, you know, another example for the relation between linear velocity and angular velocity, uh, it's, you have to look at the direction of linear velocity. Linear velocity is always along the tangent. It's tangential. For example, if you have a string with a stone at one end and you're holding the other end in your hand and you're rotating, and if the string snaps, then the stone is going to fly out tangentially. It's not going to fly out to the center of the circle, neither is it going to fly out away from the center of the circle. It's going to fly out tangentially, you know? You know what I'm trying to say. As shown in the diagram, linear velocity is always along the tangent. Although angular velocity is given here, it's uh, linear velocity is along the tangent. And to find the direction of angular velocity, we use the right-hand rule, where if the fingers give the direction of the angular velocity, then the thumb gives the direction, uh, you know, if the fingers give the direction of rotation, I mean, of rotation, then the thumb gives the direction of angular velocity. Let me say that clearly again. So if something is rotating counterclockwise, angular velocity is upwards. But if something is rotating clockwise, clockwise, then the angular velocity is downwards. So angular velocity is given by the right hand rule, while linear velocity is always along the tangent. I hope that makes sense from the diagram. A very important uh, concept is that of centripetal acceleration and centripetal force. So if even if you have an object going around in a circular path with a constant speed, like you're rotating it constantly, the speed is constant but the velocity is changing. You know why? Because velocity is also associated with direction. And you see at a certain point, the velocity is along the tangent there. And at the next point, it's along the tangent at that other point. So you can see that the direction is continuously changing. And so whenever an object moves in a circular path, even if you're rotating it constantly, there is an acceleration. Now this acceleration is called centripetal acceleration. And centripetal acceleration, represented by A sub C, is given by V squared by R, where V is the linear velocity and R is the radius. And centripetal acceleration is always directed towards the center of the circle. So centripetal acceleration is always towards the center of the circle. In fact, that's why it's called centri means center, petal means towards centripetal acceleration. And wherever there is an acceleration, there must be a force. 
Remember Newton's second law? So the centripetal force is simply the product of mass and centripetal acceleration. Centripetal force is mass times v squared by r, and it's mv squared by r. Centripetal force, again, is directed towards the center of the circle. This centripetal force is a general name given to the force that makes any object move in a circular path. For example, when the Earth goes around the Sun, almost in a circle, the centripetal force is the gravitational force. Example two, when your car is taking a flat curve, uh, you know, imagine that the road is flat and your car is taking a curve, going around a curve, the centripetal force that makes the car stay on the curve track is the friction between the tires and the road. So that's the friction there. And you know, if you're driving too fast, then there's not enough friction, and that's when you go off the road. Example number three. When you have a string uh, with a stone tied to one end, oh, that's the third time I'm saying that, and you whirl it around in a circle, the centripetal force this time is the tension in the string the tension in the string. So, it could be the gravitational force, it could be the tension in a string, or it could be the friction. And if you're talking about electrons going around the nucleus, it is the, the electric force of attraction between the nucleus and the electrons. So, in summary, the centripetal force is just a general term given to so many forces that keep an object moving in a circular path. Here is a simple example of how to calculate tension in a string. So you have this a string with an object of mass 100 grams or 0.1 kilograms tied to the end of that string and the tension in the string if you rotate it around is actually the centripetal force. So we are asked to calculate the tension in the string. And we're going to assume a certain velocity and uh, calculate the centripetal force. The formula is mv squared by r. And if you assume 5 meter per second as the velocity, then the centripetal force is simply 2.5 newtons. So that's how you calculate the centripetal force. Mass times velocity squared by radius. Okay? And now, the angular speed, which is, remember, omega, it can be calculated in this case. Omega is velocity, linear velocity by radius. So that gives you 5 meter per second divided by 1 meter. So that's 5 radians per second. So that's just, you know, the, the relation between angular speed and linear speed. So here is a problem uh, that we're trying to work out. And uh, it's uh, a, a fairgrounds ride has a 6.00 meter radius. And how many revolutions per minute will the riders be subjected to a centripetal force or centripetal acceleration whose magnitude is 2.30 times that due to gravity. So the question is, at how many revolutions per minute? You know, the faster they move, the faster it rotates, the greater the centripetal acceleration. So at how many revolutions per minute will the riders be subjected to a centripetal acceleration whose magnitude is 2.30 times that due to gravity? Now, we know gravity is 9.8 meter per second squared, so the acceleration here is going to be 2.3 times 9.8, right? So let's find out. This is the centripetal acceleration. It's 2.3 times 9.8, which is 22.54 meter per second squared. And centripetal acceleration is V squared by R, so from which we calculate uh, velocity squared and then take the square root of that, you get the velocity as 11.62 meter per second. Okay, that's the velocity. 
But we need to translate that into rotations per minute. So how do we do that? First we find the angular speed. Omega is V by R. And that's 11.62 divided by the radius, which is 6 meter, which gives 1.94 radians per second. And then we have omega is 2 pi times F. Remember that formula? From which you get F as omega by 2 pi. And that gives us 1.94 by 2 times 3.14. We're here. It gives you 0.31 uh, revolutions per second or rotations per second but the question says find it in revolutions per minute so you got to multiply it with 60 because if there are 0 0.31 revolutions per second then there will be that time 60 revolutions per minute so you get the answer as 18.51 revolutions per minute now we look at all the forces acting on a car taking a curve on a flat road. So here are the forces. Number one, the weight of the car acting vertically down. Then you have the normal force, which is, of course, perpendicular to the road, acting up. And then you have the centripetal force, which is the friction between the tires and the road. So that's given in this free body diagram where you see the weight acting vertically down, the normal force, and the centripetal force. So those are the forces acting on that car. Remember, it's on a flat road. All right. And we can set mv squared by r is equal to friction because remember, the centripetal force is the friction. And what is the formula for friction? Friction is mu times the normal force. In this case, it is mu s because it's static friction. Because there's no slip between the tires and the road. And so when you set the centripetal force equal to the friction, and then remember that the normal force is equal to the weight, so it's mg, right? Because the normal force is mg. Set them equal. And then you can cancel out the masses from both sides. And we can find that the velocity that this car can have is given by square root mu r g. That's the maximum velocity or the maximum safe velocity with which uh, you can drive around this curve without it going off the road. Okay. So... It depends on the radius of the curve. You know, if it's a sharp curve, then the radius is small. It's, it's sharp. And that means you can drive at only at a smaller velocity. Or if the coefficient of friction is small, like if it's a wet road, then the coefficient of friction is small. So now you, on that day, you can only drive even slower. So remember, it depends on the the sharpness of the curve, and it depends on the a coefficient of friction between the tires and the road. All right, I think we, we'll work out an example here. So you see, at what maximum speed can a car take an unbanked, we're going to talk about banking, but unbanked means flat road, a curve of radius 50 meter, if the coefficient of friction is 0 0.5. So mu is given, the radius is given, and we know the formula for maximum speed is velocity square root mu r g. So just substitute those numbers there. It's a 0 0.5 times 50 times 9.8. So that gives 15.65 meter per second. That's the maximum safe speed on that particular day on this curve. I hope you got that. So now uh, we are talk we're talking about our banking. We're talking about a car that's taking a curve on a banked road. So now you can see as in the diagram, you can see that the road is inclined at a certain angle because now you need extra centripetal force to keep that car on the track, on the road. 
So once again, when we draw the free body diagram, the weight acts vertically down. The normal force is perpendicular to the road. But now this normal force needs to be broken up into its X component and the Y component. All right. And so the X component is N sine theta. So we see that N sine theta provides the centripetal force. And the vertical component is N cosine theta, which balances the weight. So that's, that's the only thing to remember. N sine theta provides the centripetal force, which is mv squared by r, and N cosine theta is equal to the weight. And we are neglecting friction in this case. So now we can set those equations. N sine theta is mv squared by r, and N cosine theta is mg. I hope you understood why. Because N sine theta is the centripetal force, and N cosine theta is equal to the weight. When you divide one equation by the other, you see the left-hand side by the left-hand side, the ends will cancel out, and you get sine theta by cosine theta as tan theta. But on the right side, when you divide uh, this by this, the mass will cancel out, and you get this formula, tan theta is equal to V squared by Rg. Okay, so that determines how much the road must be banked. So engineers are able to calculate the angle at which uh, the road has to be banked. And once again, you see that it depends most on the speed at which you drive. So that's why there is always a maximum uh, safe speed at a curve. You know, they say maximum speed, 70 miles per hour, or try to keep below that. Because this road is banked uh, for a maximum speed. And again, it depends on the radius. So let's work out a, a simple question to show how to calculate the angle of banking. In fact, in this question, we're trying to find the radius of a bobsled turn. And the angle is given banked at 77.5 degrees. Oh, that's a huge banking because it's meant to go fast, right? And taken at 28 meters per second, that's fast assuming it's ideally banked. So we're trying to calculate the radius of this turn, and the angle of banking is 77.5, and the velocity is 28 meter per second. So what we need to do is just apply it into that formula. Tan theta is equal to V squared by Rg, and then make the radius the subject. When you do that, you get radius is V squared by G tan theta, and then substitute. Uh, v squared is 28 squared, G is 9.8, and then 10, 77.5. And okay, when you do the calculations, you get the radius as 17.7 meter. So the radius is 17.7 meter. And uh, calculate, next we have to calculate uh, maybe the centripetal acceleration or we can even calculate the centripetal force. So calculate the centripetal acceleration in this case. What is the formula for centripetal acceleration? Isn't it V squared by R? Yes. So we know the velocity is 28. So 28 squared divided by the radius that we just calculated, which is 17.7. And you get 44.2 meter per second squared as the centripetal acceleration. Cut. The next topic in this uh, chapter is gravitation. You know that there is a gravitational force between uh, each planet and the sun. So that's what keeps the planets going around the sun. In fact, gravitational force is a universal force. That means it exists between any two objects in the universe. Could be between two people or could be between your book and you. There's always a gravitational force of attraction. This gravitational force of attraction depends on the masses of the two objects and the distance between them. So if you have two objects, one with mass little m and the other with uh, caps m, and the distance between them is r, 
then the gravitational force is given by a constant multiplied by the products of the masses divided by r squared. Now the constant is called the gravitational constant has a value 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 newton meter squared kilogram raised to minus 2. That's called the universal gravitational constant. All right, so that's the formula for gravitation between any two objects. So when we have a satellite revolving the Earth, can we use this formula to find the gravitational force? Of course. In fact, we can even use this formula to find the force of the Earth on an object. Let's go there. So that's the Earth, or sub, uh, that's the radius of the Earth, and, and you have an object right on top here of mass m. The mass of the Earth is caps m. We know that the force of the Earth on the object is called the weight. We've been using that. Weight of an object is mg, correct? We already knew that. But now from this part, we also know that the force between the object and the Earth can also be written using the gravitational formula. So these two are the same. That's why we set them equal to each other. Weight of an object is the gravitational force between the object and the Earth. And when we do that, we can cancel out the mass from both sides this will enable us to find the mass of the Earth, which is the caps M. So rearrange, you get R squared G by G, and then the radius of the Earth is 6370 times 10 to the 3 in meters. That's the radius of the Earth. Multiply by 9.8 by the constant. All right. Please don't be confused between little g and caps G. Little g is the acceleration due to gravity. It's 9.8. But caps G is the gravitational constant. So when we do it correctly, we get the mass of the Earth as 5.96 times 10 to the 24 kilogram. And somebody asked me, does this include the mass of the buildings? And the answer is obviously yes. Because where did the materials for the building come from? They all came from underground. So no matter how many buildings you construct, the mass of the Earth does not change on that account. But remember, there's interstellar dust falling on the Earth continuously, and on that account, the mass of the Earth is changing. All right? Okay. Finally, let us calculate uh, the velocity of a satellite going around the Earth. So here is the Earth and the satellite. The mass of the Earth is m sub e. The mass of the satellite is m sub s. The radius of orbit, you see it's from the center of the Earth to the satellite, is r. And we're trying to find the velocity with which the satellite goes around the Earth. Okay? In order to do that, remember the centripetal force is the gravitational force. So centripetal force, mv squared by r, is set equal to this. The mass of the satellite cancels out. And you get the formula for velocity as square root g m e by r. So if we substitute the values, we can calculate the velocity. But one second, r is actually the radius of the Earth plus the height of the satellite. See that? Radius of the Earth. So R E plus H is little r. So that's the radius. And if you have a satellite revolving really close to the Earth, you know, really close, uh, you can neglect the height. And so now we can set uh, the radius equal to approximately the radius of the Earth. So in doing that, uh, we can calculate uh, the velocity of such a satellite. So they, in that case, it's going to be g m e, but little r becomes caps r e. G is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. And then you have the mass of the Earth. I'm taking it as 5.97 times 10 to the 24 divided by the radius of the Earth, which is given 
as 6.370 times 10 to the 6 in meters. And then you calculate the velocity to be approximately 7900 meter per second is the velocity of such a satellite.